I want to welcome everybody and, and thank you all for coming to our panel, The Secret Pillars of Capitalism. My name is Jeff, and I'll be your chairperson for this panel. Behind me are the, my presenters, or Ron, Anthony, Allen, and Sue. The two secret pillars of capitalism are land and money. Although they're more like flawed structures than pillars, they are nonetheless two major forces that control our economy. In the light of the economic crisis that we face today, common sense dictates that we take a closer look at these systems. We believe that these systems and the laws that they embody function to concentrate the wealth of our nation in the hands of a privileged few, the 1% leaving the majority of us in debt and or poor and feeling dependent. We use the word secret in our title because basically we feel that facts about how these systems work have been deliberately omitted in the curriculum of our educational institutions, muddled by misinformation in the mainstream media and at the source thus making it difficult to think constructively about solutions. Our panel, after unveiling some basic truths about how these two systems work, will present common sense alternatives. Anthony and Ron will talk for 30 minutes about land, after which we'll have 15 minutes of Q&A. Then Sue and Alan will talk for 30 minutes on money, after which we'll have 15 minutes of Q&A. I'm going to start off the presentation today, um, starting off with a, a discussion of land leading up to um, what Ron is going to talk about, economic rent. Uh, so basically, in order to understand our economic problems, um, we have to put it in some kind of a structure. So we, we've called, we've, we've, we have our problem, and we basically say that the root of, our, of today's economic problems lies in the fact that there has never been... They have never been true to Jefferson, uh, Jefferson's uh, principle, which is equal rights to equal rights for all and special privileges to none. And as a result of this, we have an economic uh, unjust system, whereby there's, as Jeff has mentioned, there's a few people who are very privileged and controlling our system and reaping the rewards of all of our hard work. Um, so. Essentially, we want to talk about what happens when our hard work gets, when the, when the, when the, the benefits of our hard work gets reaped, um, more or less. Um, so we call that economic rent, and economic rent basically is the master to unlocking the key to the system. Um, and an understanding of this is crucial. Um, but before we can talk about economic rent, we have to talk a little bit about economics. And given that we're at the left forum here, and many of, our, many of the panels here are talking about economics, um, we're just going to briefly go through some of the core principles of economics. And I'd like to start by asking the question, what is economics? It's a, it's a, is it an easy question or is it a tough question? Um, the way we start understanding economics is taking a look at the classical economists. And we have our dear fellow here, Adam Smith, Thomas Malthus, David Ricardo, John Stuart Mill, and our good friend Karl Marx, um, who has a pretty strong presence here at the Left Forum. And we also look at our good friend, Henry George. Um, so these are basically the classical uh, economists who basically have talked about the discipline of economics uh, throughout all of human history and civilization. And they were trying to basically analyze the events that were happening at, their, at, at the time of their lives, during the time they lived. Um, so how do we define economics? We define economics by calling it a social science that examines the nature of wealth and the natural and man-made laws governing its production and distribution. Notice there are key words, wealth, production, and distribution and distribution. So what do those things mean? First, we have to take a look at what wealth is. So most of us, you know, have pretty good understanding of what wealth is, I think, or maybe not. 
Um, so the classical economists essentially defined wealth as basically the product of land produced by labor and capital to satisfy human desires. Have you heard of this definition before? Yes? So if we're going to talk about wealth, we want to know how it's produced. Correct or no? So how is wealth produced? When we're studying economics, this is, this is the process of analyzing the things that work together to produce wealth. So those things basically are called factors of production. And we call them land, labor, and capital. Has anybody heard of this before? Does it sound familiar? Some of you who have taken economics? I'm sorry? Based on Henry uh, Some of it, yes, correct. Um, Henry George is part of one of the classical economists, so yes, he's also talked about it. Um, so let's start first with defining one of the first factors, the factor of land. So what is land exactly? Land can be, land is considered the entire material universe, excluding people and their products. And another way of looking at land is thinking about it as the commons. Has anybody heard of this before? There's a lot of panels here that are talking about the commons. So what exactly is the commons? The commons is everything that belongs to all of us, right? We can, these, these things are kind of obvious, wouldn't you say? Um, so the next factor is labor. So what exactly is labor? Labor is basically all of human exertion, both mental and physical, that goes into the production of wealth. These things are very basic, obviously. You can't miss the point that labor, labor on land uh, produces wealth, right? Not human labor, Not human labor? Well, yes, machinery. We'll get to that, actually. Animals. Animals, machinery. I mean, you can think of it as machinery in a sense. They're, they're sentient beings, uh, but their labor is used to accelerate uh, production. Um, so, yeah, so I've mentioned so far land and labor. We could also look at land and labor as two primary factors that goes into the creation of wealth. Um, and the third factor we can look at is called capital, so which, actu which essentially arises from land and labor, the two primary factors. Uh, capital is just basically a subset. So what is capital essentially? Capital is wealth that is used to produce more wealth. So once we've used labor and land to produce wealth, um, we can then use that wealth in the production of additional wealth. Are you with me so far? Mm -hmm. All right. So if we were to put all of these factors together, this is pretty much what it would look like. So this is the basic, this is the basic foundation in economics when looking at the production of wealth. You have all the different factors, land, labor, and capital, um, going into the production of wealth. So you, so you have your laborer, you have your land, you have your capital, which is the machinery that's used to produce more wealth. But the wheelbarrow, which is the capital, did not come into existence prior. It came into existence because of the use of labor and land. Um, Thank you. So that's how that's how we can look at uh, that's how we can look at the production of wealth. And you know, basically. Basically, we have, we have produced all the wealth, um, which is the easy part, looking at this picture here. We've produced all the wealth based on these factors. So the difficult part now is how do you, how do you distribute the wealth that's been produced? And this is, this is essentially where the fun part starts, talking about the distribution of wealth. So the easy part is looking at how the wealth is produced, basic economics. Now, how do we talk about how the wealth is distributed? So how is wealth distributed? So we have our wealth pie here, with wealth in the middle. And we go back to our factors of production. So we look at them working together to produce wealth. Um, these can be thought of as inputs. 
Um, and so logically and reasonably and morally, what would be the right thing to do if these are the factors that go into the creation of wealth, the production of wealth? You would think, based also on what the classical economists have talked about, that given the inputs, uh, you would give back to those things that produce wealth with the amount of effort that they put into it, right? Mm -hmm. that, that seems to be a very logical conclusion. So when we talk about distribution of wealth and we talk about inputs, what are the outputs? The outputs, we can, we can, the outputs are called avenue of distribution. And what happens is that whatever is used for land, whatever land is used, whatever land is used, whatever goes back to the use of that land, we can call it economic rent. And whatever labor is used, we can call that wages. And whatever capital is used, we can call that capital returns. Return to capital goods. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, another way also to look at capital, for example, is saved up labor. Um, and the, the, important thing, the important thing about this, this panel here is that we talk about economic rent. Um, because such a huge percentage of it goes to the privileged class. And this is the part where Ron will explain um, what economic rent is and give you a pretty good uh, illustration of how that works. So I'd like to introduce Ron to pick up from where I'm leaving off. Thank you. Okay, so uh, what I really would like to talk about is that slice of the pie, which we call the economic rent, because it is the key. It is the uh, portion of it that uh, gets missed all the time. People don't see it. It's not obvious. So hopefully in 15 or 20 minutes, I can make it a, a little bit more obvious to you at why that third of the pie is so important. Um, I just might mention that uh, these definitions that we've given, definitions are neither right nor wrong. Uh, they're simply more or less useful in facilitating thought. In the case of land and economic rent, it is though economists have redefined rent in a manner calculated to dispose of the term altogether. So uh, we apologize for the part being very simple in the beginning, but if you don't have the basic foundation in language to think about these things, then you really can't progress. So we've taken the time to establish a language, which is just something that will be useful uh, for our discussion. <coughs> okay? So I'd like to just uh, touch on a few key points about, about why economic rent is so important. Uh, the first point is that current economic theory pays relatively little attention to land. The lion's share of attention goes to labor and capital. It makes it appear as if the great class struggle is between employers and employees. Land is treated as a mere incidental, an afterthought, uh, simply a cost of doing business. In truth, about one-third of the GDP can be directly attributed to land, according to some economists who lie outside of the mainstream, people say like Michael Hudson. Okay. Uh, an analogy to this might be uh, trying to create all the colors of the rainbow with only using two out of the three primary colors. Primary colors are red, yellow, and blue. You cannot produce all the colors of the rainbow if you take the blue out. You can't produce purple. Uh, you can't produce green. So if you want to understand the full picture of how distribution goes in there, you've got to leave the primary blue in there. Uh, if you're going to understand the full uh, distribution, okay? Second point is that the land is our common heritage. That portion called the land is our common heritage. 
as we have pointed out. And as such, the return to land factor ought to be shared by the people, the commoners. We are the commoners. Uh, it's our commons. And I specifically use the word ought because it is a moral term. Ought is a moral term. And as we hope to show, in the final analysis, this is a moral as well as a practical consideration, the economic rent, okay? Uh, the third point that I'd like to make is that if anyone still doubts the importance of land, what I suggest is that they just check out the prices of land today, okay? So what I'd like to do now is give you an illustration uh, to kind of get a, a better understanding of economic rent. So what we're going to do now is to look at some land prices. And we're going to look at some land prices in Manhattan, okay? so. There's some uh, land prices in Manhattan. Um, it's interesting, when I, when I Googled land prices in Manhattan, the first thing that came up was uh, Manhattan, Montana. <laughs> <laughs> it happens to be a little town in Montana, and land was selling for uh, 23 cents a square foot. I figured it, but they don't sell it by the square foot in Montana, they sell it by the acre, but I figured out based on an acre, it came out to about 23 cents. <laughs> a uh, square foot. Uh, not quite the same situation on the island of Manhattan. So uh, just very briefly, this is, these are just approximations, they're averages, uh, uh, just to give you an idea of the, uh, the, of the land prices in Manhattan. If you go, if you start at the north in uh, Inwood, which is way up at the northern uh, tip of Manhattan, price is going to be about $150 a square foot, a square foot, $150 for land, just the land, unimproved unimproved land. Uh, Washington Heights, it's around 250. Harlem's around 500 per square foot. Uh, Morningside Heights around Columbia University, 1,500 a square foot. Uh, Upper East Side, which is probably the highest uh, zip code in terms of income uh, in the United States, probably the Western Hemisphere, uh, a, a square foot of land on the Upper East Side goes for $3,500 unimproved. Um, Upper West Side is about two thousand. Uh, around Columbus Circle, it's about twenty-five hundred dollars a square foot. Uh, Times Square around two thousand. Chelsea is around eighteen hundred. Pace, where we are, is about two thousand dollars a square foot. Lower East Side is about fourteen hundred, and Wall Street is about twenty-seven hundred. So that gives you some sense of the uh, value that people place on land in Manhattan. So what I'd like to do, don't do the slide yet, but I, I know Anthony told me people freak out when they see uh, bar graphs. So trust me, it's the only one, and it's really simple. All I've done is <laughs> I've, I've taken this information and I've just made it into a nice, simple bar graph. <laughs> All righty, so there are the land prices in Manhattan per square foot. Just get the big picture. Uh, the left side is uh, the horizontal is the location. So you've got from downtown Wall Street all the way up to Inwood. You can see, you know, where the high priced land is. You can see where the low priced land is. If uh, you ever arrive in a city and you want to know where the movers and shakers are, just check out where the tallest buildings are because this graph is almost a duplication of the skyline of New York City. Uh, the, the pricier the land is, the more uh, high they have to uh, uh, build the buildings in order to collect the rent to pay for those sites. So um, it, obviously Wall Street and uh, those areas, that they're going to have very tall buildings there, very tall. So, um, okay. so just to, there's a few uh, points that we can take from this uh, uh, graph. One thing we can say is that the price per square foot is a pretty good correlation of its productivity. People are not going to pay uh, high prices if they, they can't produce maximum output. So 
um, it's a pretty good indication. So the connection between what we spoke about before about production of wealth and the price of land is, is, very, is a very obvious direct connection there, okay? So now the next question that arises is if those bars represent uh, the production of wealth on the different sites, and we said earlier that is only three factors that go into production of wealth, land, labor, and capital, uh, and what we want to find out is what portion of that is due to the land. That's the issue. How much of the wealth that is being produced is due to the commons, due to the land factor, okay? So let's see what our next slide, Scott, where are we going with this? Okay, so let me, let me just briefly uh, describe this. In order to think of that, what economists do, they, they make economic models. They do experiments, thought experiments in their mind, and they say things like, well, there's three factors, so if we hold two out of the three constant and then examine the result, we'll be able to say, well, then the result must be due to the third factor. So when they, when they hold things constant, the Latin term is ceteris paribus, it just simply means holding all things constant except one factor, and then you can see uh, what effect that factor has. So to give you an illustration of this very highfalutin Latin uh, term, if you just imagine a typical newsstand in, in New York City, we've seen them all over town, right? It's just a little kiosk. There's a vendor inside selling newspapers and sodas and umbrellas, etc. right? Okay, so what we say is, Let's hold that, that constant. That, there's, that represents the capital, which is the building, the newspapers, all that is his capital. That's the capital. And the vendor himself, say he's putting in an eight hour day, is the labor, okay? So we say, if we take that newsstand, right? And we hold it constant, we put the same newsstand on all the different locations that we've just looked at before, let's see what we get. What do we get? <laughs> we get this. Good. So um, this is rather startling. Equal skill and effort is being applied on all the sites. The guy comes in eight hours. He sells as many newspapers as people are willing to buy. And yet at the end of the day, if, you, if we, we can transpose just in your mind the price per square foot is, let's say, newspapers and magazines sold. Um, at the end of the day, having spent the same amount of effort, used the same amount of capital, there's a, there's a lot more productivity on some sites than others. Does that, ma does that make sense? Yep. Right? I mean, well, if, what if you're saying is that the guy in downtown just sells more newspapers? Yeah, because of traffic, basically, okay, essentially, okay. right? So, I mean, if, if anyone had a choice and said, well, you know, where would you like your newsstand, you know? I think most people would say, well, I don't want to go out to Inwood. <laughs> I'd rather have it in one of those high rent districts because I know I'm going to sell a lot more newspapers in my eight hour stretch. Now, the, it, the question becomes, um, notice that what's important here is the great uh, variety in the productivity of land. Right, given, e given having held two of the factors constant, there's still a significant uh, difference in the productivity. So obviously that has to be due to the third factor. The third factor above the red and yellow has to be the land factor, the locational advantages of one site over another. And that in, in, is really what the economic rent is all about. It's the locational advantages of uh, land versus a different a piece of land. Um, okay, so let me just gather my thoughts here and we'll move on. Let's see. One th another thing is interesting to note here is that the vertical axis, which is the price of land, is infinite. Uh, you know, I guess when, you know, at some point the whole island of Manhattan was sold for $24 worth of beads, whatever. Um, obviously, the price of land has been going up over the centuries. Uh, somebody said maybe it's eight billion, I don't know. Whatever the numbers are, um, it's clearly 
uh, land prices have gone up over the centuries, and they can continue to go up. There's no reason, there's no end to it. It's, it's, it's an unlimited, uh, the vertical axis is unlimited. What's interesting is that the horizontal is absolutely limited. As uh, Will Durant quipped, they're, they're not making land anymore. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Manhattan Island is Manhattan Island. It's about 28 square miles, and it's going to be 28 square miles, uh, more or less. I mean, if they dig up a little dirt and throw it, you know, downtown and make Battery Park, they've just taken a little bit of land and, you know, repositioned it, for, in effect. So basically, um, the horizontal axis is, is uh, finite. Uh, I won't get into the details, but economists, when they talk about supply and demand, what they'd say is the supply is inelastic. It cannot expand. There's no way that the horizontal axis, they can't make more land. So uh, the only thing that can change in, in this supply and demand curve here is going to be the price of land. So um, as uh, civilization advances, New York City becomes more and more productive. That increase is going to always show up in the increased value of the locations. That's that's simple logic, okay? So um, that's really important. So let's see what we can move on. Go say, yeah. um, yeah. how much time do I have? Not, not much, so please. Not much? Not much. Not much. Have another. Okay. okay. Eeks. Okay. Um, okay, we'll move on. Very quickly, the economists define uh, the margin as the least productive uh, site under equal market conditions. So simply, inward is really the margin. It's the least productive site given, and if you have the same amount of capital and labor there, everything above the margin essentially is due to the land and its economic rent, and it's due to the existence of the community, that, that difference in production, okay? Moving on quickly. So now we can define economic rent, having laid out our basic terminology and hopefully getting a, a rough feel for this. Uh, economic rent, very simply, it's that portion of the wealth yielded on a piece of land in excess of that yielded at the margin under equal market <coughs> conditions. I'll just let that just sink in just for a moment and connect it to the diagram uh, and realize that how great a portion of the productivity in Manhattan is due not so much to our individual efforts, whatever we may be doing in the city, if we have a job here. It's due to the collective existence of how many million people all working together in consort, uh, plus the natural advantages that Manhattan has, everything from excellent harbors to granite uh, subsurface so we can build huge buildings. All the natural advantages that the la land has, plus the advantages that the existence of the community brings, all flows into making the land very valuable. All right, so just to move on, um, quickly, just, just you, might, you might be curious, I know, you know, it's the left forum, everybody loves Marx. Um, so I just thought I'd throw this in. It, the Communist Manifesto, it was his first early writing, and this was actually the first demand in the Communist Manifesto. And he said basically, he says, abolition of private property and land and application of all rents of land to public purposes. So Marx, Marx said that, okay? Um, okay, I'm going to just... Yeah, we're just going to terminate this with just, I can't say much more about the solution that I was going to, but there it is in, in essence. So let me just say this. Uh, the solution in a nutshell is, is right there. Having understood the situation and the problems, the solution becomes apparent. Um, and the solution is to the economic rent, which is due to the land that is the commons, which we all create and have a share in, should be distributed to the community for the community good. So we collect the economic rent, we collect that blue portion, and that's the community chest from which the community pays for all of its needs. 
the concomitant to that is having gotten all the money that the community needs, we B, abolish all taxes on capital and labor. No more need to put a fine on people who work extra hours or build a more beautiful house or a factory. They're not, no longer would be penalized. Once the community gets the economic rent, that's all that's needed. Everything else goes to the uh, people producing the wealth. And we, and we just end by saying that's uh, what um, Thomas Jefferson had in mind. He said, equal opportunities for all. We all have equal opportunity to uh, access the land by simply paying to the community the, the, the rent, sort of like a user fee. And in return for that, uh, th and there will be no special privileges. We will not allow a small portion of the population to monopolize all those economic rents. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. Oh, so question we'll take and answer. Questions now, one at a time. Uh, yeah. Yes, this gentleman here. Oh, sure. Thirty uh, years ago, when I moved to Vermont, I was involved in the study of the land values with. Uh, a person, Lee Webb, and uh, I think he went on to hold a position in the government. Uh, it was, um, what we found out was uh, all the waters that run over the land is owned. All the, all the water, all the waters, the water is considered the common but the land underneath is owned. We looked it up and they all came to an anonymous box number in, in uh, Albany. The mountains were the same, all forest covered. Uh, that was the commons. But underneath the commons was uh, the, the, the private ownership. And then, um, you know, uh, I just pointed that out. Mm -hmm. Do you know who owned it? Okay. Yeah, like the land? Yeah. The, the Great Northern Paper Company, yeah. and, uh, <clears throat> and there was another, slips my mind. Since I had a stroke, I, I don't think so well. But uh, the Great Northern Paper Company owned most of it. And they uh, just recently are uh, reselling it because they've used uh, all the resources. The, the resources of it. Well, let me, let me just, uh, just uh, connect this very, very simply in, in a... Uh, a system where the economic rent was uh, collected, essentially what, what the state of Vermont would have done is said, look, here's this beautiful forest on the mountain. Um, it's the commons. Um, it's on the auctioning block to the highest bidder. Okay? Whoever that highest bidder is, is going to get that site. And he's going to get security of tenure on that site. And he's going to pay the economic rent for that. And he's not going to bid too high unless he can get enough productivity out of that site to pay for that economic rent. He's, he's not going to be allowed to hold that thing out of use because somebody else will bid him a little lower and take it. So um, the, the effect of it will be that the community will collect the economic rent for that uh, site. And then it'll be up to the owner of the land either to put it into use for the benefit of all or to take a, a bath. He's going to lose a lot of money if he doesn't use it. Uh, so, you know, it's like, use it or lose it. <laughs> so there was a question about um, land length, the hoarding of land. Uh, and I'm trying to make the connection to unemployment. I mean, if land is hoarded and not used, and the Great Northern Paper Company, uh, whoever they are, whoever they really are, who own that company, have bought that land or got control of that land 100 years ago, they've been not doing anything with that. How does that affect us in our ability to work and have employment? Mm -hmm. 
Well, naturally, you, you would think that any able-bodied man or woman who wanted to work should, should, should have an opportunity to work. What, what's holding people back from, from doing things? Obviously, access to land is very expensive. Um, and it gets more expensive when a percentage of it is held out of use. Makes it very difficult. And then when wages are suppressed because the community not collecting the, from the community chest is forced to tax the wages that we do earn, uh, we're, we're just barely scraping by. And a lot of us are not scraping by. We're getting into debt. So how are those people ever going to start up businesses, right? They're, they're going to be dependent on uh, people who already control the land to give them jobs. So there, there's that kind of a connection. Um, if you leveled the playing field, made more of the land available, people had a really good living, you would probably see much more people getting together in a cooperative associations getting some access to land and capital and, and, and going into business. Also, once um, people begin to make money, that's effective demand. You have money in your pocket, you want consumer goods. You want consumer goods, that's a need. Somebody, something will arise to meet that need. Factories and so forth will arise to meet those needs and you will get basically a positively reinforcing cycle. Another, another way to, <coughs> answer, to answer your question, another way to look at it is talking about the economic rent. The, the economic rent basically is created based on the value that's created from the location, from all the economic activities. So those who own a concentration of the land is capturing the economic rent, which is part of the wealth that's created, and therefore putting a burden on the rest of society, putting a burden on wages, putting a burden on capital. Um, putting a burden on wages in the sense that ordinary people have to pay all sorts of taxes, um, sales taxes, uh, payroll taxes, everything you buy essentially there's a tax somewhere. In addition to where you live, there's also a very high rental uh, value that you're paying. Um, so all, all of those are ways that you know the value, the economic rent is being captured back into the privileged class. Therefore, putting a burden, and also, and, and putting a burden, also minimizing the opportunities that's created in the society for employment, um, you know, uh, various business opportunities, for example, people are going into business for themselves. Uh, so that's another way, also, I think that your question can be answered. Okay. Um, Do you have a question? Yeah, I get the equality implications, but given today's world, what about the uh, implications for the ecosphere? I mean, it seems driven, this drives development. I mean, it pays to maximize development. Right. right. Well, let me say briefly, uh, once people begin to... Re the question? Yeah. Okay. Let me say briefly, once uh, it gets into the consciousness of the people that the planet Earth belongs to all of us, that it's ours, it's the commons, and it doesn't really belong to us, it's there for our use. We're here simply as stewards or trustees to use it, not abuse it, and then pass it on. Once that consciousness begins to enter in, into the public mind, there's going to be a great deal more respect for the land. Also, because of increased income of the ordinary person, there's going to be more potential for all kinds of ecologically uh, generated activities to, to happen. People locally getting together, uh, creating all kinds of uh, activities that could help. The government will have more fun, uh, money to fund all kinds of uh, green activities. Um, right now, none of that can happen because everybody is basically living at the stress level, right? Everybody's overextended in debt, and they're just <coughs> worried about survival and, and paying the bills. So once we stabilize the economy, people will really have a greater opportunity to uh, focus on those issues. I, I would add, I mean, just the mere fact that that land is concentrated also because the goal of owning land and, and owning natural resources is to make a profit. And if you're in the business of making a profit, you know, it's very unlikely that you're interested in the benefits of the community or the benefits of the environment. So today we can span across our world and, you know, canvas all the different issues with water issues, deforestation, um, you know, various 
types of Ill, you know waterborne diseases arising in certain parts of the world because of you know poor sanitation issues. Um, so all of those are going right back to land ownership, and by a very small percentage of people, um, for the pure purpose of making profits without any consideration at all for the well-being of the community. We have time for one more question. Anybody? Other schools of thought largely postulate two other factors of production, management and information. Do you? Uh, very simply, everything that you can think of will fall into one of those three categories. What is management information? What does it mean? I mean, management. Uh, yeah, an individual manages a business, right? Okay, that's simply uh, mental exertion. It falls under the category of labor. All management is labor. Simple. It's wages, and they're entitled to wages for their uh, input. Is there any other thing that you can think of that goes into the production of wealth that would not fall into one of these three categories? No. I, I, you know, tell me if you can. Anything. It's either going to be a human being putting in the input, or it's going to be the planet Earth supplying something to work on, or it's going to be a congealing of that labor and that land Thank to a tool. tool later. Thank, Thank you. To <laughs> move on okay. to our next presentation. I'm going to make the case that, and Sue as well, that the creation of money of our medium of exchange is rightfully public matter. Um, public money. So my talk, just two main divisions, I'm going to talk about various forms of money and then what is it that makes them all be money, essentially what is money, what are some important things about money and what money is, and secondly, the struggle, talk about the struggle through history for public control of money versus the private interests, and the banking interests that are uh, controlling a lot, basically, our money supply these days. So what is money? First point I want to make is that there are many forms of money, but right now most of our money, in fact, not just right now, I think this has been the case for a long time and will be the case before or after any kind of monetary reform, that most of our money goes from one account to another. When I pay my internet access, a 42 gets subtracted from my account balance and a 42 gets added to Time Warner's account balance. And that really is the money. Um, probably 90% or more, 10% um, or less is coins and bills, and they say that about two-thirds of the actual currency, American coins and bills, is overseas. So you get to a figure more like 97% is digital or account money. Um, the, the digital electronic stuff is new, but account money itself is nothing new. Um, they discovered clay tablets with cuneiform records of debts, credits and debits, uh, in ancient Mesopotamia going back 5,000 years. Also hieroglyphic things from Egypt and so on. Uh, David Graeber, I have a quote here uh, from his book, Debt, the First 5,000 Years. He says, some of the very first written documents that have come down to us are these Mesopotamian tablets recording credits and debits. Um, so it's nothing new keeping accounts. Uh, far preceded coinage, by the way. Coinage started to become widespread about 700 BC. Some examples of money, account balances, cowrie shells, beads, sacks of grain, metals by weight at times, ounces of gold, ounces of silver, coins, tally sticks, Early America at times tobacco and beaver skins were commodity monies. Uh, so the point is, what makes all these things be money in a given time and place? 
what do they have in common? Money is taken many forms. So what is the nature of money? Essentially, they all function as a medium of exchange for us. So money is really defined by its function. Uh, it serves as a commonly accepted medium. Um, <coughs> if Scott has a bookstore <coughs> and he's got a book and he wants $20 for it, why is he willing to accept this piece of paper for it? Because he can turn around and do, get something he wants with it. So the fact that it's commonly accepted is essentially what allows it to be money. And you'll notice that it's of an abstract nature, because there's no reason that why else would this be worth 20 times as much as this one? <laughs> it's not the content of the material. Um, so it's most of what we use as money has not been commodity monies, although at times there have been silver and gold by weight, tobacco, certain things that were, was the actual intrinsic nature of it that was the value. But mostly what we use is of an abstract nature. A um, couple other functions the economists mention is money functions as a uni unit of measure, so it allows us to compare apples with boats or what have you, and a store of value. So medium of exchange. <coughs> I just really covered this. Why do people accept it? Because in turn other people will accept it. So the fact that it's commonly accepted is, is what is essential. And then I want to come back to my point, is this a public matter? Uh, it's certainly something that's serving the public. And I would say that certainly, we certainly should consider it a public matter. Um, I mean, I wonder if we couldn't even consider it part of the commons. And maybe we would have a, a better money system that would work better for us. Um, now, another aspect of the public nature of money, the money supply means the overall quantity of money. Um, just want to make the point, does the overall quantity of money relate to price levels? Well, yes, when there's more money in circulation, prices tend to go up. Um, so that, again, is a reason why it's a public matter to, to have, a, have some limits and control over the stabilizing the over, overall quantity of money and letting it grow at a reasonable rate in accord with population and, and maybe economic growth. Um, so what we've done so far is established money is whatever is functioning as a medium of exchange in a given community and that the overall quantity of money is a crucial variable for maintaining stable wage and price levels for a stable economy. Uh, it's the st one of the stated of objectives of the Federal Reserve System was to bring stability, but it hasn't really done that, has it? Um, examples of money again. Now, all these many forms we can classify into these main types. I've only mentioned commodity monies, such as the, the precious metals by weight, or or tobacco, or sacks of barley, back in ancient Mesopotamia at times. Uh, um, so that, that's, well, that's what commodity money is. It's, it's rather cumbersome to uh, go get the gold and carry the gold around and trade the gold and put it back in the safe. Um, so most of the money we use is, is of an abstract nature, and uh, fiat, it's fiat money, which gets its value by, by law. And that can be further divided into credit money, i.e. money created by banks when they make a loan. Most of us don't know that they're not lending existing money. They're, they're really creating new money. And Sue will talk more about that. And the 
disadvantages of this being our, our current medium of exchange. Um, but there is also debt-free money that can be issued by government. Uh, gov Congress has the power to create money. I just want to relate back to our theme about the commons. Under this, I think you, we could include land that um, Ron and Anthony talked about. Also, aspects of our cultural heritage, like money is something that seems to be a uniquely human thing. Uh, language, art, knowledge, customs. So I, I'm just suggesting maybe our shared medium of exchange might be something we start to think of as part of the commons. Okay, so second part, and this will be fairly brief, um, public versus private control of, of the issuance of money. Um, this has been an ongoing battle through the ages. Uh, just give some examples from United States monetary history, the public versus the private. Um, under these these public things, I'm going to give a brief picture of or slide on each of those. Under private, essentially, the bank credit money has dominated. Money created when banks make a loan. Most of our money supply consists of that, and this is where you get into all these confusing distinctions between M0 and M1 and M2, the monetary base, and all this stuff. The Fed doesn't have direct control over the overall money supply because it's created when loans are made. They only have control over the monetary base. So, so we get all this confusing stuff. And we've had three different central banks. The first bank of the United States was Hamilton's bank, chartered for 20, 20 years in 1791. 1811. Then the second bank of the United States again was chartered for 20 years from 1816. Uh, I guess there were debts and problems ensuing after the War of 1812, but in any case, Jackson made it a big point to, to uh, kill the bank. He thought the bank, private bankers, these are privately owned institutions, by the way. And again, Sue will talk more about the Fed, which uh, Federal Reserve Act was 1913. Um, so, most of the time, bank credit money has dominated, although we've had these definite examples of public issuance of money. So the colonial scrip, all 13 colonies eventually uh, started issuing their own money, although the British wanted to prohibit it. So there's just a couple pictures. Uh, the continental currency was issued during the Revolutionary War, and it did its job. Uh, the story is that it declined in value. Uh, one of the important reasons for that was the British counterfeited tremendous quantities of it. <laughs> so, and it also says in Wikipedia that these it wasn't coordinated with the states, so the states were continuing to issue currency. As well. uh, or I guess at that time there were still colonies. The right? um, United States Mint was created with the Coinage Act in 1792. That is publicly issued money. Um, just the coins, that is. And the Legal Tender Acts, uh, 1862, in, in the Civil War era, um, the so-called greenbacks were issued, which were simply issued by the government debt-free. Why should the government go to the banks and say, can you lend me some of you know, our official United States <laughs> currency? But this is what's happening. The government writes, creates treasury bonds, and they get bought. So the, the buyer of the bond is the lender. The government is the borrower. One of the quotes on your sheet that I handed out says that by the same token that a government can create a, 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 
a, ch a bond, a dollar bond, it can create a dollar bill. The, what makes the one reliable will also make the other reliable. Um, so the greenbacks were also, were called U.S. notes. I meant to bring an actual example. They're, they're actually collector's items uh, that you can buy on eBay. I, have, I bought a few. Um, and they were issued for over 100 years in various series. Um, but again, during the Civil War, there was a, there was a strong uh, fight to suppress the greenbacks and the, the, the bank credit money soon overwhelmed it and became our dominant form of, of money. So the problem is, even with the greenbacks, the money creation power has never been taken away from the banks. So even if the government is issuing some public money, the bank's power to issue money overwhelms it. So when a loan is given, somebody gets a mortgage, they get that money in their account, then they pay it to the seller, and the seller spends it on something, and so it circulates around as money until the loan is repaid when it, poof, it's gone. And again, Sue will talk more about that. Um, the Constitution gives Congress the power not only to tax and to borrow money, which is all we ever hear about with the fiscal cliff and all this stuff. What are we going to do? We can't tax anymore. People are over and we borrowed too much. The federal debt's too big and this is all you hear about. Why don't we hear about Clause 5? <laughs> Congress has the power already to coin money and regulate the value thereof. And how does one regulate the value of money? The quantity, exactly. The value of money essentially relates to the quantity of the money supply. Okay, um, so it's all about taxing and borrowing and Henry Simons in the 1930s uh, so the mistake lies in fearing money and trusting debt. Uh, he's one of the authors of the, well, the Chicago Plan, which came out in the 30s, which was to actually take away the money creation power from the banks as well as issuing public money. Um, this is an unjust, privileges, unjust privilege. As long as banks create money that didn't exist before the loan, we have a recipe for transfer of money from the many to the few. Uh, this guy is an English chemist, Frederick Soddy, who wrote some books in the 20s and 30s for monetary reform. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he did was he related the financial debt which grow exponentially with these compound interests and yet it's that's not the way the real physical world is we have these exhaustible supplies of, of, of fuels and so on and that energy obtained cannot be used again so we have a disconnect between between uh, the numbers and the real physical world um, so I'm just quoting from his preface I'm about to wind up here and go to Sue. Uh, he says, the money power is nothing less than the power to create and destroy money by adding and withdrawing figures in bank ledgers without the slightest concern for the interests of the community. And he says, to allow the monetary system to become a source of revenue to private issuers is to create first a secret and illicit arm of government and last a rival power strong enough ultimately to overthrow all other forms of government. So what we accept as our money has far-reaching consequences. What we use as our medium of exchange. There are those who argue for a gold-backed money, although that's never really been the case. There's always been more money circulating around than the actual gold. Um, there are those who say money is credit. I'm going to wrap up. Well, if money is credit, then what is money? Isn't money what we use to pay a debt? Why, why do we have a, another concept of money? So the commodity money is an intrinsic value, and the other two are of an abstract nature. So 
depending on what we accept as our money, we'll determine who's controlling our money system and ultimately our society. So this is what it's about. We want to separate the function of issuing money, which is a rightfully public matter, from money lending. Hi, I'm Sue Peters. Um, I love to talk to people about what our money really is because, to me, the secret of it has kept from the American people so that we can be oppressed terribly, and not just us, the whole world. This secret, they don't teach in school. They don't tell you what money is in school. The economists don't want to deal with money, right? The historians, they look at civilizations, they don't see, they don't say, well, what was the money? Which is the most critical thing when you have a civilization, is the money. You can't have a society unless there's money, because people have to exchange to get their needs met. So to me, this is the most critical, and it's secret, and it's under, t unfortunately today, it's under the control of private parties, okay? And what Alan was saying is we have to educate the American public about this, and we have to show them we have a history of public money that doesn't oppress us, a really strong history, an important history, okay? So that's, that's really what I want you to get from my talk. Uh, the I'm going to talk about the current monetary system, the basic kernel of it, okay? The current monetary system is private. The issuance of our money is in private hands. They make all the decisions. Private commercial banks create what they call bank credit, which functions as our money. Alan said 97% of our money is bank credit coming from private commercial banks, not from our government. And it's debt. Okay, how is it, de how is it debt? How is all our money debt? Private commercial banks do not lend your deposits. See, you think, here, you think you go into a bank and you put your money in the bank and you have your bank statement and there's your money, it says $2,000. And you think, because you're told by the media, you're told in school that what a bank does, this is what our medical banks do, they take your deposits and they lend them out, right? People need money, so they're going to take your deposits and lend them out. Wrong. 100% wrong. One percent. They don't want you to know. And I can give you a bibliography at the end if you want to give me your email. I'll send you my bibliography. You can read about it. It's, it's there. So what happens? It's the exact opposite. You go into a bank and you need money. This banker, many bankers, will say, okay, I'll give you a loan. Sign that loan agreement. You want the money, right? You think you can pay it back. You sign it. This banker goes into his system. He creates the money. It didn't exist before this was signed. It did not exist before this was signed. He creates it. He says, legally, have a loan document. He types in $2,000 into the borrower's checking account. Oh, the borrower can go off and he's got money. It didn't exist. So what that means is the money supply just increased by $2,000. Okay? Now remember what Alan said. Holding the quantity of our money supply equal is going to keep the prices equal there's no growth, right? So that, that money supply has to be monitored by people who want us to benefit, right? 
you know, you know what a money supply that suddenly expands, think of the housing bubble, and then suddenly contracts, think of 2008, and we lost jobs. What else did we lose? People committed suicide. <coughs> the control of the quantity of that money is under the control of private banks in this kernel. This is what they do. Everyone who walks into a private bank and makes a loan is creating new money. The money supply is expanding. Not good for the American people. Okay. So our money is created. We go into debt to private banks. Uh, can you hold your question? I know, I know. Can you hold your question so okay. it's really important? This is the hardest part of the secret, okay? Uh, in fact, I'll do this. I was thinking of Here's this wonderful young girl. She has debt from college loans. She needs more money to stay in college. She's going to come to me. I'm the banker. Right. Well, Miss, I'll give you a loan. Sign right here. <laughs> <laughs> the money didn't come from anywhere else. She signed that loan. I typed it in, created it. Okay, I'm sitting there being a banker. What does she have to do to pay me back? Work. Maybe not one job, two jobs. And some people are working three or four jobs pay back their debt, and what is the banker? He's just typing it up. <laughs> it really is the total injustice of this system. And you, you have to believe that, that, that making the loan and creating the money out of that loan by the banker, getting all the benefit of it, is what our money system is. It's the hardest thing they don't teach it in school, they're not going to tell you. Okay? Okay. This is the New York Federal Reserve Bank. We have a Federal Reserve. Every Federal Reserve Bank has accounts of its member commercial banks. That's what it's for. Holds the accounts of the member commercial banks. And here are some of the member commercial banks that have accounts in the New York Fed. The two big to fail banks, 2000, I think 2008, 2009. Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, Citigroup, J.P. Morgan Chase. They are the major banks in the New York Fed, right? There's more, you can think of them, the only ones that showed up in the price. Okay? All of these private corporations, they're private, they have board of directors. We don't know what goes on in their board of directors, right? All of these guys own all the shares to the New York Federal Reserve Bank. You can't own it. Our government can't own it. Only them. This is a privately controlled system. You will hear that on the news media. You will be taught in school. I can give you some documents. I have a capital report from the Fed from 2006 that tells you all the banks that are members in the New York Fed and how much capital, how much money they put in to buy their shares. Okay? I tried to get an updated version. They send me an email and it says, if your question is important, we'll answer it. They haven't <laughs> answered it. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> I'm serious. Okay. This is just going over again, you know, when uh, Alice is the accounting money. This is what it looks like in the accounts, right? They, they, here's this nice couple, and they're signing their loan, and the loan contract goes to the bank, and they get the new $20,000 in their checking account, okay? And, uh, but wait a minute. Oh, wait, 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 wait. A bank doesn't give a loan ever unless there's interest, right? <laughs> Come on now, you know. They're in it for profit and control, okay? So what about this interest? Well, where is it? The banks never create the money for the interest. 
The only thing they create is the principal of the loan. I want to borrow $20,000, but I have to repay $20,000 plus $2,000 of interest to the private banker. He doesn't create that $2,000. The interest on all the debt is never created, so that means the interest on all the debt is never in our money supply. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. This poor lady here, she's got to find that interest. She's got to work for that interest, but it's not in the money supply. So this poor woman here, who's also paying off a loan to the bank, she unfortunately is going to lose her job and not be able to pay that loan. She can't. She can't get the interest and the right. But this poor, this lady, maybe she keeps her job, so she's able to get the money for the loan. Okay. So some people are going to be able to get it, and some people aren't because it's not there. The interest. <laughs> It's not there. You've got to fight for it. So you have the money supply with the principal and the principal plus interest, the debts. More debts than the money supply to pay for all those debts. When a, oh, this is the other thing. When the loan is paid off. Okay. So when the loan is paid off, the principal is gone. It's just gone. You pay off your loan, the banker wipes it off as accountable. It's gone. It uh, existed while you were paying him, and then it was gone. Okay. okay. Uh, so the principal disappears. The bank gets, oh, if the borrower defaults, the principal disappears, but the bank gets the collateral, right? Okay, I'm going to speed ahead. How many minutes do I have? Okay, speed ahead. Um, I'm going to speed through this. Boom and bust. Bye, bye, bye. The bank gives out loans for houses. The money supply expands because they're creating the money with their loans. And then sell, 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 right? The uh, debts are being paid off, but the, and when they're paid off, the money supply collapses or they default, the money supply collapses, price is falling. That's the boom and bust cycle. Our money does not have a stable money supply. We are at the mercy of private banks. Can, you, can this explain what you see around you in the economy? Yes, it can. Okay. I'm going to skip through this, the injustice of it. Um, if people want, um, I can give you, um, you know, a copy of these slides. But here, everybody is in debt to the private bankers including our government, the, uh, the largest owner of government debt are the, is the New York Fed and the private commercial banks that own it. It's not China. I can give you figures about it. Again, they don't want you to know. Okay. Um, okay, so I want to talk about the solution. And Alan spoke about it, gave some history on it. It's a strong history, very, very strong history. Uh, to see in 1660 in the colonies, people were going back to England. There was no, there was no money. They were going back. What happened? Americans are ingenious. They created colonial script from the colonial legislatures, interest-free, no debt involved here, from the colony, and they issued it, and it circulated, and the economy grew, because you need that means of exchange. And we had our nation, ultimately. Okay? Here's the solution. has three parts to it. Okay? Government issued money. How do we do it? The U.S. government, and this happened in Canada, by the way, the U.S. government comes and buys those shares in the Federal Reserve Bank. It happened in Canada. Canada had government-issued, interest-free money from their government-owned central bank from 1660 to 1970.
from 1938 to 1974. And that's when they got their health care and their education. And I can, there's several books written about it. And even the Canadians are denied that history. <laughs> okay. Two, like Alan said, we have to take the power to create money away from the private banks. It can't be bank credit anymore. We can't have it. The banks going forward can lend what their depositors put in the bank. That's their job. But they can't create it. And the U.S. has to spend this government-issued debt-free, debt interest-free money for the benefit of all of us. The you know, the Congress is the one that decides where the money is spent. It's under the control of the House of Representatives, right? At least we have a chance, if, it's, if the issuance of money is coming from our government, to control it. We can't do it in the private boardrooms of banks. You know. And so that's, that's really, um, it's indestructible money, government money. It doesn't go away when a, a loan is paid, because not anything you do with a loan being created and extinguished, okay? And job creation, that's the major point, right? Of getting back the control of this. We all need jobs, there's no jobs out there because of this system. And um, I recommend the American Monetary Institute. They've been working for 15, something like that, years. They work with Congressman Kucinich from Ohio when he was in the House of Representatives and he, and he drafted a bill that had these three things in it, all three. So it can be in Congress and we can educate the American people about Thank you very much. Do uh, you have a question before the fellow with the, the or was it yeah, answered? I'd love, love to repeat the fundamental question. Which is, I don't get the money creation thing at all. In other words, I take out a loan, they say, here's 20,000 bucks, I take the 20,000 bucks and I buy something with it, and that bank is darn well better pay Caterpillar tractor for the things that I bought. So, it doesn't sound like there's any money being created. What's going on? What am I missing? Where did the bank get the $20,000 to give you for your loan? Where did the bank banker get the $20,000 of money to give you for your loan? But is it not from the wait, 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 let him, let him answer. I don't know. You're telling me that he made it up somehow, but, you know, Caterpillar Tractor is not going to take made up money they want. <laughs> money. No, money is so not I'm not understanding it. Well, it, <coughs> the made up part is that he... Um, he types it into your account. Right. That's the made-up part. Yeah. Okay. Right. Literally. Now, in our country today, <laughs> checking accounts, because it's in your checking account now, yeah. right? And we all have checking accounts. 97% of our money is in checking accounts, right? Those checking accounts, everyone is giving checks to each other, right? And, and so you transfer the money around to different banks, right? And it's used as money. But it didn't exist until you signed that loan document and he had, he had to type it into his system. You know? So why can't I make a bank and start creating money myself? You can. You can. You can. You can. Get a good can. bookkeeper. <laughs> and That's right. If you have enough money to It's all on the account. That's right. It's all on the account. That's why it's a good business. Two questions. One of them is, what do you think about um, complementary or alternative or local currencies um, in addressing this? And second is, could you elaborate on sort of like the ecological impacts of interest rate debt? Okay. The first, uh, the first half was uh, about the local currency. Local currencies are great because they're debt-free, interest-free. They're doing the exchange. The only thing why I'm not working 100% for local currencies is we have a nation. And if we don't get rid of this system in our nation, when those 
currencies are working very well locally, someone in this nation will come and stop it. They can't have that as an example of something that's successful. <laughs> they have to wipe that out. They've done it with government issued money in our textbooks. They've wiped it out. They've called it, you know, fiat money. And, you know, they say the government will just print so much money. Well, they're the ones who are creating all the money and causing all the problems and controlling our society. Okay, I set it up. Yeah, uh, Ecological. Yeah. Well, I said a little, a little bit about that when I mentioned uh, Frederick Soddy, who spoke about how, you know, basically w we look at economic growth and it's these numbers, and war spending counts just as much as others, you know. So, you know, and sp any kind of transactions that occur, so we have these numbers inflating at exponential growth. And yet the physical economy is not like that. So if we had a stable money that was under some kind of rational issuance and stable quantity, increased gradually with population, um, a lot of the power that goes with, with money creation as with debt-based money goes away because banks would have to lend actually existing money. And if you think about what goes on in the world, what gets built, what doesn't, you know, the fact that we have rather paltry public transportation compared to what it could be, um, factories, buildings, developments, roads, it, it's so much under this control of this private credit issuance is such a huge power, you know, to finance what goes on. It would be very different if it had to come from existing money, which was a public, publicly controlled medium. Uh, yes? Uh, how does the creation, the creation of money ties into the fact that bank by law have to maintain, uh, I think, 10 or 15 percent reserve? Uh, yeah, right. Unspendable money. Uh, can you explain that? Yeah, that well, this is what's Gets, keeps, us, uh, keeps us all confused, the so-called fractional reserve yes. banking. Um, and it's not even really the case anymore that the amount of money is limited by, you know, 10% has to be in reserves. But this is, this is the creation of not lending existing money, but they create, it goes back to supposedly the goldsmiths would start to issue these certificates of, of, of people's gold, and they would, they would start to be tradable without coming back and getting the gold, and then they started to realize they could issue more than there was actual gold there. And then we, this evolved into what we can call the fractional reserve banking system, so that the, you know, only a small, you know, their so-called reserve requirements are somewhat obsolete at this point, because really, it goes the other, the causality isn't from how much is in reserves to how much they can blow up the money supply. When they want to make a loan, they make a loan, and then they adjust the reserves. They can borrow from the Fed. The Fed's just this giant enabling thing. By the way, I want to introduce Jamie Walton here, who's worked with Dennis Kucinich, <laughs> or still does, and is representative of the American Monetary Institute. How does the international monetary uh, fund operate sort of internationally? I mean, uh, over the last 40 years to exploit, yeah, let me go back to this question that you had, sort of the, the natural resources of, of third world countries. Yeah, well, that's the game. That's the, that's the big thing is uh, monetary control and basically taking over the land. I mean, it's very connected with the, the land thing. Um, getting these n nations to sign these loan contracts at, at interest rates that, that they're not, and have to, having to change their economy towards single crop production for selling on the world market, it's becoming less food self-sufficient. Yeah. 
Would it be safe to say that this debt-based system, the Fed... Can you hold your question just one second? Oh, can you say, talk louder? Would it be safe to say that the in the international, at the global level, what is happening is a transition towards a what you're describing here, which is a debt-based yeah. system. Okay. That's what that that's the project yes. that is underway. That's right. no, it's already, it's already happened. Yeah. It's not yeah. just every country in the world. This is not a sound mic, so it's I a recording mic, so it's not doing anything. Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it looks like a good mic, though. It looks <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, most of the countries in the world have this system, debt bank credit. They have um, central banks that are privately controlled. Um, the third world debt, that I think everyone heard about that Jubilee 2000, that third world debt, what well, maybe you didn't hear is that that debt through the IMF, the World Bank. When you go, who was actually creating the money from the loans to the third world? On that debt, the majority of that worldwide third world debt were those owners of the New York Federal Reserve Bank. It came right back to New York to them. That's the kernel that we have to change. Also, the, the deregulation of banking is actually doing the here. Really allowed them to get less and less out of the monies that were on deposit, but that is guaranteed for the loan. So, less and less money was kept in banks. I just am um, curious what you think is going to happen with the student loan situation based on the fact that there is no a trillion dollars of made up money. Um, and there are not enough jobs to create the money to pay back, and there's no collateral other than a human being on a student loan. And it's right now the largest um, amount of debt. I'm wondering what you think is going to happen in the imminent yeah, future. After mortgages, by a long shot. But yeah, right, just, isn't it the highest? Just past credit yeah. card debt. Yeah. 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 So about a trillion each. I think about this all the time, and I'm curious with someone that's more educated than me what you think is going to happen in the next five years with that situation. Might be a lot of defaults. Um, uh, I don't know if I have a crystal ball. What's, what's going to happen with it? What do you think? <coughs> well, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. The lack of collateral is what really concerns me. That the collateral is a human being as opposed to, yeah. you know, what I mean. So that's what's really boring me. Yes. Yes. It's, and and that's that's what I hope would happen because the collateral on those student loans, like you said, is is human beings. These students who had bright hopes to, to, to make th their life better got into debt, and there's no jobs for them. So how are they going to pay it off? And so if they go into default, that default travels with them, right? If you default, that goes on your credit report. Your employers find out about that. This is it's the most horrible thing that we've done to our younger generation, horrible, horrible, horrible that's been done to them. What I would hope is this, that there's enough pressure, because I see that there is pressure about changing those laws, enough pressure that those loans and paying back can go on for a certain time. And when you can't pay it back, that at that point it's taken away from you as a person. That's it. It's gone. You know, if they did that in Mesopotamia. They had debt jubilees. People were in debt. The farmers were in debt, right? Lost their farms and all. Lost their farms, right. Concentration of wealth, which is ultimately the goal here, right? So if let's have a student loan debt jubilee, right? You try, you try, you try, you can't do it. Wipe the slate clean. That's what I would work. That's what I would work for. How? Okay, we keep hearing that a lot of these companies are sitting on a lot of money and not hiring people. How does that tie into this? 
you were talking about the banks sitting on money. What about the companies that are sitting on money? Sure. Yeah. You mean the large multinational corporations? Well, it's yeah. easier to speculate than the greater jobs. Um, I don't know too much about how much money they're sitting on. Well, I, I don't either, but that's what they're telling us, that they could create jobs but the, instead, they're sitting on all this money. Maybe they don't see it as profitable. It's it's easier to speculate on asset inflation. Uh, Ron wants to say something. Let me just connect. connect. These, these two issues are connected. So let, let's make the connection between the land monopoly and the money monopoly. When you have a land monopoly, wage earners, the most of us, we have very little to spend in the economy. Right? Very little. But it's when we pay for our rent and our, our little bit of food and, and interest on our credit card. So, Effective demand is very weak in our economy now. The demand is because you don't have anything to buy things with. You can't demand that people go to work to produce things for you. When you straighten out the land situation, effective demand will increase. You'll have more money in your pocket to demand things. And then people will have to arise to meet those demands. So new companies will arise, production will increase, okay, to meet that need. Don, you know, um, the Federal Reserve System is paying uh, the banks interest on their reserve. So there's no incentive to take a risk and try to lend any money if they've got enough money to operate the banks and pay everybody in the banks. Right. Um, this is what I think they're talking about, uh, corporations that weren't banks, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. The thing I can say that there is a great book by a British man, Ro uh, his name's Robert Robotham. R -O -W -B -O -T -H -A -R. Michael Robotham. What's it, Michael? Michael Robotham. And it's all about um, globalization. And he starts with that kernel of private commercial banks creating money out of all of our debt, right? And he shows that worldwide, corporations are in debt to the banks. So the corporations are in debt, the people are in debt, um, uh, the states and um, local local uh, towns are in debt. You know, we're having bankruptcies in the towns in the United States. Okay. Um, um, so I just want to say, what he shows is that this kernel of creating money by private banks, putting everybody in the society in debt, is ma the major, major problem. Um, can you say something about the meeting that I understand is going on of some of the royalty from throughout the world and some of the leaders, alleged leaders from throughout the world, that are meeting together to find common ground to affect the world economy in their behalf? And I mean, I call it the Biderbeck group, but I don't think that's really Build the name. Build 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 there is a group up in Canada called Global Research, and you can get on the email list, and they sent out a list of all the participants that are meeting right now, I think it's in England, in this secret meeting, and included are uh, HSBC Bank, Goldman Sachs Bank, a couple of other owners of the New York Federal Reserve, um, plus some economists from our major universities here in the U.S., right? Um, so, oh, Royalty. journalists, U.S. journalists, certain U.S. journalists are sitting with them, talking with them, a very select group. But this is how they keep the information away from us. This is how they do it. They're making plans. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.